All right, so welcome back. We're continuing to talk about the American Civil War. Um, today's going to be a little bit different. Uh, what I want to emphasize and focus on today, um, rather than the buildup to the war, now that we're past that, uh, Lincoln's been elected, the different states have seceded from the Union. So now what we're talking about are the battles themselves. So what we're going to talk about today are kind of pivotal battles of the war and, and a little bit about what happened, but not so much about, you know, the troop movements and all that stuff necessarily. Uh, what I want to do is paint a picture for you about how costly and horrible uh, the American Civil War was. So I'm going to kind of go highlighting some of the battles, and I want you to pay attention for a few things. One, whether it was a Union or a Confederate victory. Two, uh, the number of casualties in the battle. And then there's a few little other notes uh, here and there that I'll tell you as we go on through. But um, to get a real picture of how devastating the American Civil War was, you kind of have to know um, the number of people dying, okay, and how bad that was. Uh, for comparison's sake, in the entirety of the American Revolution, in the entirety of the American Revolution, uh, there was maybe a total of about 20 to 20 to 3,000 casualties, okay? Uh, so keep that number in mind, 20 to 23,000 total casualties in the American Revolution. Uh, and look at what we're getting here in the American Civil War, right? And another thing to keep in mind is every casualty in the American Civil War is an American casualty, okay? Because it's the North versus the South, so they're all Americans. So after... Uh, the states begin seceding from the Union. Um, we begin to have, uh, you know, kind of the first uh, instances of fighting in the war. The first shots fired in the Civil War were at the, at the Battle of Fort Sumter in April of 1861. Um, ironically, in a war that would see astronomical numbers of casualties, there were no casualties at the Battle of Fort Sumter. Um, it was a Confederate victory. We'll just say South because my handwriting is terrible. Um, so it was a Southern uh, victory. Uh, the only casualty really at all at Fort Sumter was a Confederate horse was killed by cannon fire. Uh, but other than that, uh, no casualties. The, um, the Union uh, commander uh, who was in charge of the fort uh, just felt overwhelmed a little bit by the number of Confederates or Southerners that had attacked the fort and waved the white flag and kind of gave it up before much of a fight. So this wasn't really a battle, traditional, like a traditional war battle, but nonetheless a victory for the Confederacy. Moving forward, the first real battle of the war was the first battle of Bull Run or Manassas. Some of these battles have multiple names uh, because the people in the north may call it one thing, the people in the south call it something else. In the case of Bull Run, the Northerners call it Bull Run and the Southerners call it Manassas. The Battle of Bull Run um, has really a total of about 2,860 casualties, so not too high. 2,860 casualties, and ultimately it's a Southern victory. Um, this is in Virginia. Uh, people thought this war was going to be really, really short. Uh, the Northerners looked at the South as people that were just upset and there'll be a little bit of fighting and everybody will go back home and say that was stupid. Well, Bull Run tells us that maybe that's not the case. In fact, on the day of the battle, people went out and picnicked outside, uh, you know, kind of out in the field to kind of watch the fighting take place. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's how people felt about the war when it first started. The great moment of the first battle of Bull Run is when the Southern General uh, Stonewall Jackson, this is how he got his nickname, Stonewall Jackson, um, is standing out there in the field on his horse, and he had been shot in the hand. So to prevent his, the blood from clotting in his hand, he was holding his hand straight up in the air and just sitting there with bullets flying everywhere, just on his horse, um, not at all seemingly concerned with what's going on. Uh, other commanders see this and 
They tell them, hey, look at, look at Jackson over there standing like a stone wall. Let's rally behind the Virginians because uh, Jackson was a Virginian and he inspired uh, the troops here to, um, you know, do, uh, do great things and essentially leads the South to victory. Um, or his, his example leads the South to victory in this incident. Okay. Um, after the battle... Uh, there, there was a, a man that lived nearby, a man by the name of Wilmer McLean, who owned a large house. And what would happen during war is um, the military would go try to kind of commandeer people's houses to use as hospitals to treat wounded soldiers. So Wilmer McLean gave his house up for the, uh, you know, Union soldiers to use. Uh, and then after that, he and his family said, we're going to get as far away from this as possible so they moved to a small town called Appomattox, further away in Virginia. Ironically, four years later, when the war ends, um, they go to the home, Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant, they go to the home of um, Wilmer McLean, the same guy, uh, to sign the treaty to end the war. So Wilmer McLean can actually say that the Civil War began, really, and ended at his house. The next major battle uh, is the Battle of Shiloh. Now, this is where the casualty numbers really start to become alarming. At, uh, at the Battle of Shiloh, there's about 23,796 casualties, so more than the entire American Revolution. And this is over two days. It would be April 6th, um, April 6th and 7th, 1862. God, my gosh, that's terrible. Um, sorry about that. I shouldn't even bother writing anything. Anyway, April 6th and 7th. Yeah, April 6th and 7th, 1862. Um, 23,796 casualties uh, in this one battle. Uh, this turns heads all over the country. Uh, just in the pure shock of what uh, what had taken place people never heard of you know a, a battle where there's this many casualties this many people dying people were shocked that this was happening um kind of at this alarming rate so the so the deaths here are very very high shiloh also stands out because it's the first significant union or northern victory so it's a victory for the north at the battle of shiloh it's also kind of the first significant battle uh, of the career of Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, through the Battle of Shiloh, Grant started to rise to prominence as a um, noteworthy northern general. And as we'll find out later, pretty much all the great generals in the Civil War were from the South. So they really needed uh, some strong leadership and some good generals to push them forward. Uh, and the Battle of Shiloh was, was an important moment um, in the war because it kind of showed that uh, the North had some people too that uh, could actually go out and win a battle. So one of the few battles in the first half of the war that the North would win. Most of these battles um, are Confederate victories. Next significant battle is kind of a weird one. They're kind of locked together in call, uh, as called the Battle of the Seven Days. They took place from um, July or June 25th to July 1st, 1862, and they were basically just a series of battles uh, each day that have kind of been lumped together as one major battle. Uh, don't worry about the casualty numbers with this one because they're very disputed just because of the nature of the fighting, uh, but it was another Confederate victory. We'll just say C because that's easier to write. So it's a Confederate victory. Um, and it helps establish a pattern that we'll often see from um, a pattern that we're all, that we'll often see from the northern generals, particularly General George McClellan. One big advantage that the Union Army has is numbers. They've got a lot more soldiers. They got more guns, more technology, more of all that stuff. But the South has much better generals, much better tacticians. And by the time the Battle of the Seven Days comes around, Robert E. Lee is now the commanding general of the Army of Northern Virginia, or the Confederate Army. And, um, 
having fewer numbers each day in the first six days of the battle of the seven days uh, he's defeated he's blown back or pushed back by the um, you know kind of pushed back by the uh, Union Army then on the seventh day he regroups uh, and makes a big assault against the uh, uh, against the north and they got nervous uh, and backed out and took off and, and got on their boats and took off. We'll see this sort of thing happen quite a bit during the war, where um, the North has a big tactical advantage, but they don't press their advantage, and then they end up losing it, and at the first sign of trouble, they take off. This is because the North has very weak generals. Uh, General Grant wasn't here. It was a guy by the name of George McClellan who would be a really, really poor, um, a really, really poor general. And um, you know, there'd be multiple scenarios in which he would back out. Uh, you know, when the conflict started to look like it wasn't going his way. Next significant battle is actually the Second Battle of Bull Run. 26, 2,860 roughly casualties in the first Battle of Bull Run. The second Battle of Bull Run, 25,000. So we're seeing the war, if you're looking at these numbers, we're seeing the war getting increasingly violent, increasingly bloody, um, increasingly horrible for all. Uh, the second Bull Run is also a major Confederate victory. George McClellan, the guy that was the Union general in the Battle of the Seven Days has left the army for a while because he was kind of embarrassed uh, about his losing, okay? Um, and uh, he's replaced by a guy named uh, General Pope, Erwin Pope. Uh, the people don't, the, the soldiers don't really like him. Uh, he's not a very good tactician and uh, basically things uh, didn't go particularly well, and Second Bull Run turns out to be another big victory for the Confederacy. Uh, because of their mismanagement, the Union soldiers, um, you know, just had no chance to really combat successfully against a superior, uh, more tactical Confederate army. Uh, and the fighting spirit of the Confederates was so great. Uh, in this battle, at one point, there was a, a, a small pocket of soldiers, uh, Confederate soldiers, who ran out of ammunition. So they started throwing rocks at Union troops because their ammo was low. These guys just wanted to win. They were engaged and committed to this conflict. Uh, and that's what helped them in the early years of the war. Next major battle is the Battle of Antietam. It turns out that Antietam is the bloodiest day um, in the history of American warfare. It's a one-day battle, um, September 17th, 1862. Uh, and in one day, there's roughly 23,100 casualties, one day. To put that in context, um, on D-Day, about 4,700 soldiers were killed on D-Day. American soldiers were killed on D-Day when they stormed Normandy. A lot more, thousands more were injured, but 4,700 were killed. Um, on 9-11, uh, you know, there were 2,300 people killed. This was a horrible, horrible day in American history um, with, like you said, 23,100, some estimates as high as 27,000 uh, casualties in one day. Um, Antietam is kind of weird to say who won the battle. It's really more of a tie um, because tactically it was a Confederate victory, uh, but the Union had such greater numbers. The Union Army had about 125,000 troops. The Confederate Army had about 75,000 troops. And the Confederates fought and fought tactically very well, but they had, you know, they were against numbers that were far superior. And um, when the casualties started to mount up a little bit on the side of the um, on the side of the Confederacy, Robert E. Lee decided to pull his soldiers back 
uh, you know, basically and live to fight another day because, um, you know, if he would have kept it going, he may have lost his entire army. Who knows? So, um, basically, this was a big uh, opportunity missed for the Union Army who really could have crushed Lee here. They failed to do that. Uh, Lee managed to escape while inflicting heavy losses, heavier losses on the Union than on the Confederacy. Uh, and Antietam goes down at the end of the day as the bloodiest single day um, really in American history. 23,100 killed or wounded um, and just an incredibly horrible, horrible day. Move forward a couple months to around Christmas time, you have the Battle of Fredericksburg. This is a major, not really a turning point, but a big, big moment in the American Civil War. It's December 13th, 1862. Um, and Fredericksburg is in Virginia. Um, ultimately, just like many of these others, it would be another Confederate victory. Um, and uh, command of the... Union Army now falls to a man named Ambrose Burnside, who was another really poor general. Grant has not yet taken over full duties with the Army. Um, so at Fredericksburg, there's really, there's a, about 17,000, uh, the numbers are about 17,129 casualties, uh, which again, you're looking at these numbers, incredibly high. These are one two-day totals, right? Second Bull Run was a few days, Shiloh was two days, Antietam one day, Fredericksburg one day. Um, the big moment in Fredericksburg is when General Burnside ordered the Union troops to attack Lee at the top of a hill. Um, and if you know anything about military tactics, the person with the high ground has a huge advantage. So essentially you're setting yourself up for death and failure. Uh, and what happens here is uh, what happens here is um, you know the soldiers are forced to listen to this you know crazy idea to charge up a hill so they do what they're supposed to do uh, and they just get massacred um, stories go that General Lee wept as he saw them coming up because he knew that he was just gonna destroy them that shows the human side of a lot of these generals even though they're fighting over the cause of states' rights or economic sexualism or slavery or whatever, they're still hurt by the fact that they're fighting against their own people. They're fighting against Americans. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not inherently evil. It's fighting really for what these people believed in at the time. And on the, in the case of many of these military folks, it was the ideology of states' rights. And... Um, Fredericksburg quickly turns into a rout, a Confederate victory. Uh, it was December, so it was cold. Many of the soldiers that were that were ordered to run up that hill, uh, Mary's Hill, um, when they if they weren't shot, uh, they would cover themselves up that night to stay warm because if you were to get up, they might get shot by snipers or whatever. Um, they would cover themselves to stay, keep warm uh, underneath the bodies of other dead soldiers. Uh, just to stay warm through the night. Uh, this was the low point, right? Uh, Fredericksburg was really the low point for the Union Army in the war. But actually, it would get a little worse for a second. And there's a bunch more battles on here, but I'm going to stop at this one, uh, the Battle of Chancellorsville, and I'll send you another video with the other half of these. Uh, but the Battle of Chancellorsville is also a Confederate victory, and it's probably the last great Confederate victory of the war. This was um, on May uh, 3rd. Um, May, well, the battle was from about uh, um, April 30th to about May 3rd, uh, 1863. And... In this battle, uh, was significant for two reasons. Number one is Confederate victory. In total, you're talking about 29,961 casualties, roughly. Uh, some numbers are higher, some are lower. That's just what you get with the Civil War. Uh, it would prove to be the Confederates' greatest tactical victory. 
Uh, basically, they snuck in on a Union encampment. The Union soldiers were expecting to um, face the Army head-on, face the uh, Confederate Army head-on, but they were outflanked by Stonewall Jackson, who attacked them from the woods, overran them, and got a really dominant victory for the Confederacy here. Now, the downside is it was at this battle where Stonewall Jackson was shot uh, and ultimately died from his wounds, um, ironically shot by his own sentries, his own people, um, when he was out surveying the battle, uh, when he was out surveying the, the outcome of the battle after the first or second day, um, he was mistaken for a Union soldier he got shot at um, and uh, died uh, about seven or eight days later, um, you know, in, in, on, on a bed in a nearby home. Um, this is incredibly important, okay, um, for the war effort. Because without Stonewall Jackson, the... Uh, the Confederate Army loses a ton. Uh, Robert E. Lee was the head general, and then he had two guys at his side, um, Stonewall Jackson and James Longstreet. And Stonewall Jackson was a great tactician, great tactical general, would help Lee with just about anything. Um, and after Jackson was shot, before he died, he had, they had had to amputate his, his, left, his left hand his left arm. Um, and uh, when Lee heard of that, he said, General Jackson has lost his left hand and I have lost my right, meaning that Jackson was his right-hand man. And he knew that from that point forward in the war, things might change, which indeed they would. Okay. So, because I got the rest of the slide here and this is going to kind of fast forward through it, but we're already 22 minutes in. So, um, you know, we're not going to cover Gettysburg, Vicksburg, Chickamauga, uh, the Battle of Atlanta, or the Siege of Atlanta and the Siege of Petersburg until tomorrow. I'll put together another short video, hopefully not this long for you tomorrow, that covers the rest of these. And uh, you should be pretty well caught up with the rest of class. So uh, email me if you have any questions or you want to go over anything a little bit more. Just let me know. Thanks.